Hello and welcome back. In the previous lecture, we have seen all the core concept of Apache Spark that you should really know. And also we have ran our first Spark application. So in this lecture, let's discuss about adding the structure to your Spark, which means we'll discuss about some of the basic structured APIs in Apache Spark. So without further ado, let's get into it. So let's get started with the Spark structured APIs. So in this video, we are going to discuss about the main motivation behind adding a structure to Apache Spark and how this motivation led to creating some high level APIs which are very popular today, namely data frames and data sets and their unification in the Spark version 2.0 and above. So when the Spark SQL was introduced in the early Spark releases, it was then followed by the data frame API, which is very popular right now. And it was a successor of the RDD, which is resilient distributed data set. So we have already got some idea about what are data frames. And we have also ran our first application, which was totally based upon data frame, where we have created a data frame on top of a CSV file and applied some transformation and actions to it. So you know what it means really. But we need to understand first what is RDD and what is the reason of adding the structure to Apache Spark and what are their benefits? Because some of you might be wondering why we are not using RDD that much nowadays and why we are only using the structured APIs and especially the data frames. There are some reasons behind that that we'll discuss now. But first we have to know what is RDD and what's underneath the RDD. So let's discuss that now. So RDD is like the most basic abstraction of Spark. And there are three characteristics associated with the RDD. The first one, which is a dependency to define the RDD. Then comes the partition and the compute function, which we are going to submit on the RDD. So all these are the integral parts of a simple RDD. So first the dependency. So this list of dependencies is nothing but instruct spark how this RDD is constructed with its input, which are required to create an RDD. So when necessary to produce the result, spark can recreate the RDD from all these dependencies and it replicates the operations on top of it. And it gives RDD a resilience. The second one is partitions. So partitions, nothing but provide spark the ability to split the work into parallelized computation. So if you know about SDFS, then you know how this parallel processing and storage work in Hadoop. So when you are reading the data from SDFS, Spark will use the locality information for sending out the executors the specific work which is close to that data. So this locality is very important of optimizing every Spark application workload and that way very less data is transmitted over the network. So that is very important. So if you want to know more about locality, we have it covered in our Hadoop full course. So you can just refer to that. And finally, RDD has the compute function, which will produce an iterator for the data. So this was a very simple structure of a RDD, but there are some problem with this original model. So for the first thing, the compute function. So this compute function is opaque to Spark. So opaque means that the Spark does not know what you're doing with your compute function. So whether you're performing a join or whether you're applying any filter or selecting some columns or doing some aggregation, Spark only sees a Lambda expression because you submit a Lambda expression if you want to do any operation in case of RDDs. And there is another problem which is related to iterator. So the iterator data type is also opaque for Python RDDs. So Spark only knows that it's like a generic object in Python. So these are two major issues. But furthermore, because it's unable to inspect the computation or the expression, Spark has no way to optimize that expression. So whatever we have discussed in the previous lecture, the lazy evaluation, then we got the DAG to optimize your job. So we cannot take advantage in case of RDDs because it doesn't have any structure and Spark will not know what operations you're going to do on top of the data. So since Spark has no knowledge of the specific data type in that iterator to Spark, it's like an opaque object. So it, it has no idea if you're accessing a column of a certain type with the object. So this clearly affects the Spark's ability to rearrange your computation. 
and convert it into a very efficient query plan. But there could be some solution. So the solution is very definite that you have to provide a structure in Spark. So as in Spark 2.0 and above version, they introduce a few key schemes for structuring the Spark. So one is to express the computation by using common patterns found in a data analysis. So these patterns are expressed as a high level operation such as filtering as well as counting or aggregating. This provides the added clarity and simplicity and it helps Spark to optimize our workflow. But what are the key merits and benefits to this approach? So the structure provides you the number of benefits including the better performance and also the space efficiency across the Spark's architectural component. So let's explore some of the benefits when we are using data frames and data sets instead of RDD. But first, we will talk about some of the most important things like the expressivity, then comes the simplicity and uniformity in the code. We'll compare the Spark code between the RDD and the data frame. So as you can see in this figure, we got a simple example of creating an RDD and applying some logic to it. And in the next one, we got how to create a data frame and how to do some transformation to it. So let's see this flow carefully. So in the first code, we just want to aggregate the age for each name. We will just use the group by using the name and then average the ages. This is a very common pattern in data analytics application. So if we are going to use the RDD, this is how the code looks like. We'll create the RDD using the spark context dot parallelize method and apply the lambda function to it to able to reduce that data using the key. So here in this case, the key would be the name of that person. And again, we will use the average to get the average for each user. But if you look at this code, any beginner will not understand much. So till now it was straightforward, but when you apply the aggregation and reduce by key transformations, it can of look a bit messy and it is very hard to read. So for a beginner or any Python developer, this will be a bit intimidating to look at if you are just getting started in Spark. So the readability will be hampered if you are using RDD over data frames. And also these functions are pretty opaque to Spark because we have just di directly used Lambda function. We haven't used any function. Spark will not know what operations you're doing on top of your data. And that is why it can hamper the performance of your Spark application. But in contrast to that, let's look at the second code now. So here we have used the data frame on the same data. So here we have created the data frame using the Spark session. So first you have to create a Spark session and then you can create a data frame using the create data frame function. So here we have provided the same data to it. And here you can see we have used the transformation like group by and the aggregate function. And in aggregate, we are using the average function to average out the edge. This is pretty straightforward and Spark will know which function you are using in, on top of your data frame. So that makes it the code very more expressive and very simpler to understand. So I hope you got an idea of why we are using data frame and why we are providing structure to Spark. It's all about the optimization. And for this simple example, I know it will not make much sense, but that if your data is growing daily and you are handling billions and billions of rows, then the optimization is the only thing you will be doing more often because anyone can build the logic, but to build a sustainable and scalable solution is a very hard thing. So you have to keep in mind that if you're dealing with a structured data, adding structure to Spark is a way to go. And it's not just a way, it's like a must thing to do in today's era. So let's take a deep dive into data frame and quickly understand some of the basic concept so that in the next lecture, let's directly jump on to the coding part so that you will learn quickly by doing some hands-on exercises. So just like supporting a different programming language, Spark also supports some basic internal data types. So these data types can be declared in our Spark application or you can define it in your schemas. So here are some of the basic data types in Spark. The first category is like the basic data types for Python and then we have the structured data type. So as you can see, these are very straightforward and I'm not going to discuss it about it more. 
so the data types are nothing but the byte type then we have the short integer long type the float double string as you can see in this table and these are the values which will be assigned if you're using python in spark and we have the structured data types as well where we have like the binary type then we have the timestamp to deal with the date and time then we have the date type then we have the array types for list tuples or arrays and we have the struct type and struct field so this last two are very important to define your schema so in our previous lecture where we have kicked off our first spark application we have given the schema programmatically using these two data types like which are the struct type and the struct field so how to assign a schema programmatically that we are going to see in further topic okay so let's discuss now about the schemas and creating the data frame so i hope you already know that how to create a data frame it was very straightforward and if you got any file spark will support many file formats like parquet json file avro file in the last lecture we have created a data frame on top of csv file but if you have a file without a header or else you have to define a specific schema to your data frame then these are the two ways of providing schema on top of your data frame so very often that the schemas come into picture when we are reading structured data from the external data sources so the defining the schema up front will provide you some benefits like you will relieve the spark from the duty of inferring the data types then you can also prevent spark from creating a separate job just to read a large portion of your file to get the schema which can be a very expensive task and also very time consuming and also you can detect errors early if the data doesn't match the schema so for debugging purpose it's very good thing to define a schema using these two ways so i'll always encourage you to define the schema to your data frame so you will ask how to define a schema so here comes the two types so either you can use the programmatic approach or the ddl approach so here in the first method where we have defined the schema programmatically we have used the struct type and the struct field data types and we have the three columns like author title and pages so the arguments we need to pass is the name of the column then comes the type of that field so here we have used the string type and you have to provide that this field is nullable or not so here is the false so that this field cannot be null so similar approach we have given for title and pages but for pages we have used the integer type so this is the native data type for spark which we have discussed in the earlier topic so this is very simple approach to provide a schema and this type we also discuss in our last lecture where we have programmatically given a schema to our headerless csv file so there is also second way to define a schema that is using the data definition language which is also known as ddl so this is very a similar approach but it's a bit simpler so you just have to provide the column name followed by the data type and this value should be comma separated and in a string so this is very similar approach as to the rdbms where you will create a table so while creating a table this is the same way you will provide schema to your table so you can choose whatever you want is two ways there are not much functionality differences in these two approaches so you can pick whatever you want okay so our last structured api in spark is dataset api this is also very popular and it is also a successor of rdd so as we have discussed earlier that the spark 2.0 version unified the data frame and the dataset api as a structured api with very similar interface so that developers like us would only have to learn a single set of api so the datasets has the two main characteristic the first one is the type and the untype apis which i have given in this figure here so if you talk about conceptual level you will think of the data frame in scala as a alias for collection of a generic object as well as data set so what is the meaning of untype and the type apis let's discuss that now so in sparks supported languages like python r java scala the data set makes more sense only in java and scala and whereas in python and r 
only data frame makes sense so this is a very strong statement so this is because like python and r are not compile time and type set languages that the types are dynamically inferred or assigned during the execution and not during the compiler time and the reverse is there in the scala and java that the types in scala and java types are bound to the variables and object at the compile time itself but however data frame is just an alias for untyped data set so this is a simple code of how to create a data set so as you can see here we have imported the row object from pyspark.sql so what do you mean by this row so this row is nothing but a generic object type in spark which holds a collection of mixed type that can be accessed using some specific index so internally spark will manipulate this row object and convert them into the equivalent types which we have just covered in the previous topics so for example an integer as one of your fields in this row will be mapped and converted into the integer type so here as you can see we have built a data set and we have the value as the 350 then we have the boolean value true and we have some string also the null value and if you have to access and we can use the index into our row object to access that particular value so as you can see here this is how in the index we will get the output of the data stored in our data set so when creating a data set you should know the schema of your data so in other words you will have to know about the data types of your data so although with the formats like json and csv data it is possible to infer the schema but for larger data sets this is a very expensive operation but if and if you are creating a data set in scala language the easiest way to specify the schema is to use the class and once you create the data set there are different transformation you can apply on a data set and these are very similar to data frames so you can use like filter the map operation group by select take etc etc and which are very similar to data frame so that is the reason these two structured apis are unified in the spark version 2.0 and above so this was all about the data set its basic introduction and how to create one and access their values and we have also seen what are the operations we can do on top of it but after this much talking the discussion isn't enough we need to also compare data set and data frames and we have to come to the conclusion and we also have to discuss about when we can use rtd and what are the scenarios where rtd is more favorable over the data set or data frames and also there is a very important topic that everyone should know if you're facing the interview for spark developer is the catalyst optimizer so this topics will require another lecture so just don't get bored we just have another theoretical lecture and after that we can start coding our spark application i am not going to bore you for longer time and i know that the theoretical lectures can be very boring but if you listen to these lectures carefully you will never need to go and google these basic terms because these are the things are, that are only asked in the big companies interviews so you have to very carefully listen to it and also make a note so that you will remember it for the rest of your lives I hope you like this lecture so please subscribe to our channel and also ring the notification bell to get the latest updates and don't forget to follow us on our social media which i have linked in the description below thanks for watching